And there's Troy. I'm here. And there's Gary. And we're and Pamela's with us. Yep. And we've got Mitchell. And uh, okay, I'm posting. So I'm going live now. Live in three, two, one. Now. Oh, I'm hearing a big echo. That was me. Sorry. <laughs> it's fixed. Okay. All right. Take two. Take two. All right. Why don't we just we'll start on. Uh, on that beautiful view of Venus, that windy view of Venus now. Yeah, it's winding up, up again. Up again. All right. So, and this is where somebody tells me that they can see what's going on. I can see the post live on your stream, but we need comments from all you people out there watching us. Or a plus one or something to yeah. let us know. And you can also contact us via Twitter at Pound CQX, pound hangout. There we go. There, I see one comment from Tim Tuck, so that's good enough. So I'm still getting some mic noise from you, Gary, just to warn you. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. But, <coughs> you know how it goes. Um, okay, so uh, we'll let this settle down. Are you going to tweet? I'm taking care of all of that. All right, I will send the, t the tweet out. So welcome to the part of the show where we use social media to get more people here and look foolish in the uh, short term. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you who are new to this, every week at roughly this time, depending on when we can get telescopes set up, we offer you a chance to view through a variety of telescopes scattered all across the United States. We'd like people from other countries, we just don't have them right now. We do when Peter Lake logs in, but his telescopes in the United States, well, he's happily yeah. done. I'm, I'm, I'm negotiating with some people in, in Europe and uh, South Africa and Australia and Excellent. Asia. Actually, there's somebody in Malaysia as well. Very so, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, And so hopefully next time we'll have more of you both in the chat with your hey, telescope. Uh, can you turn the light back on? You're getting in. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All right. All right. Okay, so why don't we get... Oh, someone's... That's you, Gary. you got a big noise is happening there in the background. Oh, okay. Um, oh, i got to close my door. One second. All right, all right. All right, why don't we get rolling? So, uh, hi, everybody who, who can see this. So... My name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Venus Today, and this is our weekly virtual star party that we try to do every Sunday night from around 7 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time to whenever. Um, and uh, so we, we pick this time so that we can have a view on the West Coast. Hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so we do view on the uh, so from the west coast, seven o'clock Pacific, and then that gives us views on the east coast around ten o'clock Pacific. Now we started, although I actually think we're probably going to have to start an hour later, so we're going to probably start shifting the time to about eight o'clock. Whenever we get nice starts, guys. So, <clears throat> so tonight uh, we've got, by my count, we have three telescopes currently, and there's one more telescope that's going to be coming in in just a few minutes. So. Um, why don't we uh, sort of explain what we got? So we've got um, uh, right now what the, on the big screen you're looking at Venus, and this is being supplied by Roy. Roy, can you uh, can you wave to us there? So there's so nope. we've got and so tonight uh, our team, by the way, I should introduce the team. Um, we've got uh, Roy Salisbury, who's in Arizona right now at his uh, really cool observatory. 
We've got uh, Gary Ganella. I don't know, Gary, can you... We can't see you, we can just hear you. <laughs> um, and then we've got uh, Pamela Gay. To provide Here I am. You. There you are. And then we've got Mitchell Duke, who's in uh, North Carolina. Hello. And he's got that beautiful view of, of Mars. So... Um, so we thought we would just start with Venus because Venus is is going down on the horizon right now, and so if you uh, don't get a chance to see it, it's going to be gone uh, pretty soon. For um, for those of you who did I get uh, cut off? Yeah. So for those of you who are um, who are able to see it, it's, if it's still on the west coast, you can go outside, and that really bright pair of stars off to the western horizon are actually Venus and Jupiter. Venus is the brighter one, and it's a little lower in the sky. Jupiter is the, you know, is the dimmer one, but both of them are really, really bright. And in fact, they're moving together to create a conjunction. So in the next probably three days or so, I think the maximum conjunction is well, on the 13th, 15th, yeah, so they're they're coming just closer and closer together, and will be really just side by side. And this is actually pretty rare. We're not you don't get a chance to see these two objects this close together. Now, if you see uh, Roy's image is really jumping around, and, and that's because um, he's got high winds at 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 his uh, place. What's what's the weather like there, Roy? Uh, let's see the weather currently. Well, it's nine miles an hour from the east southeast. Right, and uh, and that's causing because of the high magnification, it's causing the causing Venus to jump around. So, Pamela, do you want to explain sort of what we're seeing here with Venus? Oh, you're muted. There. Oh, okay. There. So, so mm. what what's happening is we have our sun and Venus when it's directly. Um, on the opposite side of the sun from us would appear fully illuminated. But then we'd lose it in the glare of the sun. So we never actually get to see Venus as a complete disk unless we use special equipment to block out the light of the sun. The majority of the time, Venus appears as the capital letter D or as a, as a faint crescent because as it passes around the sun, we're, we're eventually going to see it where it's Sun, Venus, us, and we can't see any of the part of, of Venus that's actually getting illuminated. Right now, we have this particular alignment where half of the face of Venus appears to be illuminated from our perspective, just like we sometimes see only half of the moon illuminated. It's the exact same effect. You end up with an alignment. It's not the Earth's shadow. It's actually the part that's being illuminated isn't facing us. Um, and so we just wanted to give you a view. The other thing that's, that's quite funny about Venus, I mean, is that we don't get a chance to really see a good view of, of Venus's surface at all because it's completely obscured with clouds. This is, you know, this view of Venus, which just shows it being a sort of cloudy crescent blob, is, you know, no one can really do a much better job than that just because there's just no surface features to view. It's just, this is just what it's going to look like. So we thought we would just start with Venus just because Venus is going gonna, is gonna to set in a few minutes. And then maybe, so Roy, can you switch over to Jupiter now? And then we can sort of look at some of the other objects that we've got going on yep, right now. Yeah, I'll switch over to that. So Mike, Mike Phillips has joined us and John has joined us. John, you're, just, you're here for color commentary tonight? Oh, I, yeah, you're, I think you're muted. But, um, so, okay, so we've got, uh, we've got Mike and, and Mitchell. So this is kind of cool. Both... Mike and Mitchell are in uh, are in North Carolina. They're actually right. really close to each other, and you guys have both got what 14-inch telescopes, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. So this is the twin views of Mars. Just just to show that it's completely legit, you can see here <laughs> that we're going to show the same view of Mars in two different telescopes. So check this out. So you can see now it's upside down, right? Mine's upside down. I can flip it around. <laughs> Yeah, you got to keep it real. You can even tell that they have very similar atmospheric conditions because the planet looks similarly distorted and is moving around at about the same rate in both the images. It still looks the uh, it looks fun. Whoa! Yikes! We'll go over to Mitchell's view. I love that I can do this now. I can look at Mars from two different telescopes. So thanks, guys. This is awesome. Um, 
So then, which which side is the is the ice cap? The north, Should which is on top uh, on his. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Man, it's cold out. <laughs> is it cold out there? <laughs> it's uh, been it's just, colder. Yeah. That's just phenomenal, and so you can actually see the darker parts of the uh, of the planet as well. And it looks like there's like a bright spot on Mars there. Right in the middle? Yeah. That's the, that's around the volcano. Help me out, Mike. Yeah, it's Elysium. Elysium Mons. And, and right, that's... And we have some clouds on the right-hand side. Oh, that's actually clouds. Right. That is just phenomenal. That's really cool. And then Gary... What have you got? This is, uh, is my audio okay or is it too hot? Yeah, yeah no, okay. you're good. Um, this is um, IC443, and uh, Roy came up with this last night. I have not imaged this before. So this is a 60-second exposure, and it is a supernova remnant. Wow. And you can see from the view, it's pretty big, and you can also see tendrils going off the top, down on the bottom, and uh, as Roy says, it reminds him of a brain. I say maybe a jellyfish. But I see a jellyfish, like yeah. What, what's neat looking at this one is how asymmetric it looks, where you have along the top left a much denser, brighter area of material. And, and this is what gives it the jellyfish kind of swimming that way appearance. And, and what you're actually seeing is the supernova may have gone off asymmetrically, but beyond that, the material that was distributed around the exploding star wasn't the same in every direction. And so as the explosion cleared out the area and compressed material together, you ended up with that one denser area off to the side. That's phenomenal. So we clearly have a bunch of great views tonight. I'd encourage everyone to go pop yourself some popcorn. This is the best entertainment of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's great. So what else have you got uh, queued up tonight, Gary? Uh, I'm going to go after Icy 11, which is called the Pac-Man. The Pac-Man. And then um, don't have anything new. I figure we'll do the old standbys. We'll do Andromeda yeah. next. and then uh, Sure. The Horsehead. The Horsehead Orion. So yep. I'm moving to... Um, the rosette would be great, yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm yes. moving to the Pac-Man right now, so we can look at Jupiter or whatever. Sure, that sounds great. <coughs> As Messier named it, right, back in the 1700s, the Pac-Man Nebula? Yes, yes, that's what he called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so now we switched over to Jupiter in Roy's scope. And uh, and what's kind of interesting with this is you can actually see one of Jupiter's moons off to the left-hand side of Jupiter. And again, the uh, um, the seeing isn't that great tonight. It was a much better view last night, but it's very windy. Um, but you can see the bands across the surface of the planet, and you can see um, uh, and you can see there's like a blob just in the bottom left-hand corner of Jupiter. And that's actually Ganymede, right? Was that Roy? Yeah, it's Ganymede. Yeah, yeah. And one of the really amazing things when you're imaging Jupiter is that you can actually see moons pass in front of, of Jupiter and cast a shadow across the surface of the planet. So, But we're not going to see that tonight. We'll, but we'll definitely try and sort of time things to get a nice, a nice view of that. That's phenomenal. Now you can can you mess with the brightness to actually bring out that moon a little better? Or? Yeah, I'm trying to, to to make sure that it's, there's a there's a big difference between Venus and Jupiter with the brightness, and it's uh, since it's jumping all over the place, I can't get the focus just right to get the brightness up. Mm. You can definitely see the the bands across the planet. Yeah. Yeah. And. Mike, is, is uh, Jupiter down for you? It is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, just as I was getting set up, it was way below the trees. But you guys are going to probably have Saturn coming up in another hour or so, right? If the clouds stay away. 
How's it look yeah. over by you, Mitchell? I see clouds up in the north. Uh, yeah, I see a few off in the distance. You'll probably get it before I will, too. You got less clouds in the east, or okay. less uh, trees, right? I don't know. And so, and so, I think we've, your, what's your telescope, Mike? You know, it's a 14-inch uh, Newtonian, right? That you right. built. Yeah. So it's a four, a four and a half, and with a 5x power mate, I think. And I just was moving it, the extenders in and out. I'm probably at about f28 or f29 now. Mitchell, I, don't, I can't tell if yours looks bigger or not. I don't know if the Hangout's doing anything to it. Yeah, my, mine's around f55. I got a oh, problem really? with my focal train. Image train, excuse me. So now what are you in right now? Is that I, I love how sometimes this feels like listening in on truck drivers where you know they're saying important things, but you're not entirely <laughs> sure what they're saying, or they're just right. gossiping. That's always an option. Yeah. And Fraser's talking to his children in a way that if you don't know he's talking to his children looks even more interesting. Definitely talking to somebody. Yeah. So what what do you have up? I'll there? be back. I'll be back in a second. My cat my cat just brought in a bird and dropped it in the uh Lovely. The kids are kind of afraid of it. So <laughs> I, I, in my house, we have a rule. I deal with snakes. My husband deals with dead objects. So <laughs> I fully understand. So where, where, where do you want the focus, Pamela? Uh, <laughs> um, over I'll on Gary. I'll leave it all, I'll, on Gary's. All right. Yeah. I'll be back in a second. Okay. So, so Gary, can you tell us what you've just brought up? This is the um, IC11 <clears throat> called the Pac-Man Nebula, and uh, if you look at it, you can kind of see why it's called that. Yeah. So it's clearly heading down to get the uh, fruit in the bottom right-hand side of the, the screen. Yeah, chomping all the little things. That's a uh, one-minute exposure, and again, it's in the uh, light of hydrogen alpha, so it's just the light given off by excited hydrogen. Um, in real color, this is red. And, and what's neat about this one is you can just make out um, towards the center where you can almost imagine the lower jaw of Pac-Man is located, that there's a bright cluster of stars right there. And that cluster of stars, it's an open cluster of young stars, and that's what's illuminating the entire region. This is what's called an H2 region, and there, there's one large point of confusion in astronomy is we use H2 which audibly is a bit confusing for two different things. H subscript 2 is molecular hydrogen. We actually normally say molecular hydrogen. Um, and we also have what are called H2 regions. And these are regions of space where the hydrogen has had its one electron stripped off. And in these regions, the, the hydrogen periodically re-grabs an electron. And as it re-grabs that electron, it gives off light in a whole variety of different colors, but the dominant color that we see is from the hydrogen 3 to 2 uh, energy level transition. And we did an entire show on astronomy cast and hydrogen that you should go watch. And um, so this, this H2 region glows the same red as a neon open sign, and actually for the exact same region. And that's excited hydrogen that is. Um, collapsing to a lower energy and regathering the, the electron and giving off red light. Okay, and here, uh, if anybody's interested, that's where it is in my sky. <laughs> Perfect. I can see it there, right just beside your telescope. Yeah, yeah it's right, right up there. In fact, that, I think, that Venus, huh, I might be picking up Venus with my cam. <laughs> So that one's that one's one of my favorites. I like that guy. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Do you do you have the ability at all what, to walk out that? and turn your your dome cam just a little bit so that we can see how close Venus and Jupiter are on the sky? Well, let's see. I can do a little better than that. Oh, you can rotate the dome. I can rotate the camera. Oh, there you go. 
There they are. <laughs> there you go. There's the, there's the conjunction. That's brilliant. <laughs> I don't know if people can see that. So you can see their Venus and Jupiter next side by side in the sky. And seriously, like if you're like inside watching this and you haven't like gone out with your own eyeballs and looked at these two objects blazing in the uh, western sky, you really should go and do that. It, if you're central time zone and further west, we've already lost the east coast. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my work light getting highly illuminated there, and I think I'm not, I'm not going to be able to show you much else of the insides, not from where the camera's mounted. That's awesome. Nope, there's a wall. <laughs> what, that's perfect. What, what are you using that you can steer your camera? This is, um, I don't even know the name. It's a, one of the Chinese cameras. Mm -hmm. it's, it's $99. And it comes, you know, you got full control. Well, you can see the control panel with it. And I've got them around the house. I think they're really cool. That is truly awesome. It's all, I want know. the information. Okay. This would be a great that, way Gary, to, to do so many different things. Is that a pan, tilt, zoom? Is that what you're using? Not a zoom, but okay. it's got a pan, but tilt. Okay, pan, tilt, right. Um, it's just a little small ball camera. That's and cool. it's got a little... You know, pan up and down, back and forth. It uh, it's pretty neat. When I sit here in my room working, I've got two of them out front, so I can see if somebody comes up to the house. And so we'll take requests if people are interested. Um, if you want to post, you can either post in the uh, in the thread where the hangout is actually happening over on Google Plus, or you can. Um, you can post to Twitter with the hashtag Hangout and the hashtag CQX. And if you use those two, then we'll we'll spot that and be able to uh, and be able to answer your questions and, or take any requests that you have. So if there's something you want to see, for example, uh, like the Orion Nebula or the Horsehead Nebula or some specific galaxy, we'll try and uh, show them all. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to get a chance to see Saturn before the the night is out. So. Um, now, there's a couple of questions. Uh, someone said, uh, oh, Ryan Goodwin wants to know, I'm only hanging out with seven people, but there are many more people commenting on the images. How is this possible? So, so this is what's called a Google Plus Hangout on Air. And so when you have a Google Plus Hangout, then only up to 10 people can, can interact and see each other on video. What this is, is this is kind of like we're having that Hangout, but then it's also broadcast out to a wider audience so more people can, can see it. So that's what's, that's what's going on here. And, and I saw the question, how big is the Pac-Man Nebula? It's, uh, this is coming from Jayish Kapoor. And it's uh, 30 arc, 35 arc minutes across, which makes it just a snurt bigger than the moon. And yes, snurt is a scientific size. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a smoot? Yes. Well, Although I think like smoot is probably dash. better defined. It's more like a pinch or a dash, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, what, what have you got next for us, Gary? Uh, well, why don't we get a shot of uh, Andromeda since it's the one that's going to go down the earliest? That's yeah, that's a good point. Back I to mean, the back to Mars. That is fabulous. I think. And I'm are you actually take recording my Jupiter out? It seems to be really kind of. It's it's getting too low on the horizon and the turbulence is just killing it. Is there something else that you could view from your perspective? Uh, I can look around. How about Mars? See it in color. Um, yeah, I can try it. It's about the same height as Jupiter is now, so it'll be coming up <laughs> further. It it should be pretty high. Yeah, it it's in the process it's, of rising. Uh, it's about thirty three degrees. Yeah. Yeah. So it's rising up as Jupiter's going down. So I'll go over there. Oh, Pleiades. That's perfect for your system. Is Jupiter is pretty close to Pleiades, but yeah. No, they're, they're far enough in the sky. They're a couple hours apart, I think. I think it'd be too big for this. Yeah. Oh, right, 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 right. Wrong size. <laughs> yeah. I need little tiny things. Um, one moment. <laughs> what about the ghost of Jupiter? Mars image there. 
or or the Owl Nebula? Well, the Owl Nebula will be good. Yeah, I can try that. Yeah. And so if you're watching this, if you could do us a favor and plus one this on, uh, on the Google Plus, that way we can get a, uh, we can know how many people are, are watching this. Um, so Thomas Schwartz asks, please, please tell me how I can hook up my Canon Rebel XS to a telescope. So you could absolutely do that. There's a bunch of people who, who work with us who do that. Uh, what you need to do is you, need to, you can buy an adapter. I think it was called like a T-ring adapter, and it lets you connect your camera without a without the lens directly up to the to the telescope and the, then the camera will act as the um, as the CCD and you don't use any eyepiece on it you just use a um, it just acts as a prime focus and uh, beautiful views it's great it's a really nice uh, way to set it up nobody's doing that today though right don't you do that sometimes Roy yeah, right now I have a webcam installed, but I'll, I'll switch it out. I'll switch my my Canon out to try that Al Nebula. Yeah, so he's so so it's just like what you're talking about. Roy can connect his Canon to the uh, right to the to the telescope and and get a view of it. So, and many nights we often have. I can even that. bring it in and show you. Uh, M42. John wants to see M42. Now, how's your setup, Mike, for, for viewing M42? I guess it's still still black and white. <clears throat> I'm trying to think who else would have a yeah, view of M42. Yeah, we had done that, and I actually thought about moving off of Mars, but um, I see a lot of clouds. In fact, the M42 is behind the trees for me now. The clouds are kind of being dominant on me right now. Uh, and Mars being in Leo, I'm, I'm set up with no trees around a lot of the galaxies around there. I thought about trying that out, but maybe not when there's so many clouds out. Like the Leo triplet? Can you yeah, do a, a longer like ex exposure with your setup right now? This one, the way it's set up right now, and I can pull the magnification out, it'll go up to, I think, a second or two, which when we, we did one with Phil back a month or two ago, and, and M42 looked pretty good with, uh, and it filled, filled the field of view, even, even at, without the magnification, but, yeah, uh, it's definitely deep sky capable. Yeah. It's looking pretty steady right now, I had the cooler on just a minute ago. Yeah, it looks, it looks really good. Yeah. So, and you can see on this side over here, this is Certus Major, which I think we saw in that brief hangout we had. Was that a week ago? Yeah. I can't remember. And we were talking about the uh, the clouds over Elysium Mons. Of course, as soon as I start pointing out little fine details, it starts getting jumpy on me. <laughs> so that's actually clouds on yeah. Mars. Yeah. And so what's happening is in the northern hemisphere, which I have reoriented to be up, it's the summertime, or just about the summer solstice, I think. And so as, and if you look at photos of Mars over the last few months, you've noticed that it, the polar cap was once a little further down here, and now that it's getting warmer, it's actually sublimating all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so a lot of that carbon dioxide gas is now floating across the mid-latitudes here, and as it rises up over the mountaintops and the winds carry it, 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 it condenses. I, I think that's a, an orographic process. Maybe somebody knows how to say that better than I do. Um, basically, it condenses back into the atmosphere and forms these uh, clouds. You can see it's getting dim. It sublimates. Yeah, that, that's the right word. <laughs> Fraser, if you wanted, to, yeah. I uh, I can I can give give a an example of the, uh, the the adapter you were talking about. Oh sure, yeah. So why don't we why don't we take a look at that? So there's the the camera body. This is the adapter that it's a T-ring adapter. So just take the lens off, and I can put the T-ring adapter in, lock it in place, and then here's the the 4x power mate that I use on the telescope which just screws right into that and then I can just put that in a 2 inch focuser 
And uh, and what would one of those run? Like, what is the uh, the tiering cost? Oh, maybe fifty bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And um and then is there anything else you've got to do, or I mean, how how is it for focusing? Um, I my you don't use the camera to focus. You use the t telescope itself to focus. And so, so you just like you would normally focus an IP or anything else. Right. So this is and now then, just a digital IP. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Now I'm going to get one of those for my... Well, I need to get a telescope for my camera now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got that camera. I've got a Canon. See what I can get. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, great. I hope that really teaches. So, I, I don't know. Emily Lakdawalla just uh, tweeted. And I don't know if Emily's... If she, she can, I don't know if she, she... You can join us if you want, Emily. Um... But uh, I'll invite you. You don't have to join us, though. I know you're sometimes busy. But if you have some requests or want to explain some stuff on uh, about what we're seeing on Mars, uh, feel free to join us. Um, but uh, that is, yeah. She's she's just tweeting, just mentioning how cool it is that we can actually see weather on Mars in this yeah. uh, in this hangout. So that's that is really just phenomenal. Nice work, guys. So right you can now see them both. We can just go back and forth. See, here's Mike's. Here's Mitchell's. I see clouds in both of them. You can see them see, both. You, you know, jumping around. Is, Mitchell, put yours on the uh, infrared, and I'll leave mine on the blue, and you'll you'll get kind of a, a more complete picture, I guess. So here's. Yeah, so I'm like two degrees above ambient right now, so. Oh, killing me. I need me. to plug in the cooler. <laughs> So if, those, if you're trying to figure out what I'm doing over here, I'm booting up Stellarium so that um, I can try and figure out exactly where in the sky things are and uh, hopefully add some nicer commentary on where to go next. Uh, why don't we see, check in on Gary there. So Gary, you've got a, uh, a nice view of Andromeda now. That is phenomenal. Oh, you can unmute yourself, Gary. If possible. Is it not working? Uh oh. Is it the same problem that you had before? Okay, so Gary's uh, mute isn't, or his microphone isn't working properly. But uh, so this is a view of uh, uh, Andromeda. I don't know, Pamela. Do you want to science it up here? <laughs> so, so looking at this, you see in the front there are these black um, passes cutting across the left to lower right diagonal. And those are actually places where it's not a lack of stars, but it's, it's where there's actually a lot more dust that's blocking the light of all of the stars in the arms. Uh, you can also see um, upper left, I don't know if you can get a mouse on it, Gary, uh, there's star clusters. So go up and to the left. Yes, in there. So you can see there's a series now to the right of the mouse. Yes, right in there. There's a series of little clumpy blobs. And those clumpy blobs are, are places that are similar in nature to our own Orion Nebula or the Pleiades, but much bigger. And we can actually see stars forming here on the planet Earth. Um, so it's, it's our nearest neighbor in about five billion years, it's going to cease to be our neighbor and become part of, of us as, as the Milk Dromeda galaxy is formed. And um, it, it's neat because people for a long time thought our galaxy was a lot like Andromeda, and it now turns out not only are we significantly smaller, but our structure is radically different. And it, it's neat to see science evolve as we learn more and more. And I have audio back. Um, yeah. I yeah. I had to change the size of the window. It just wouldn't respond. I changed the size of the window and it said, yeah, okay, I'll respond now. <laughs> and so you can see the two little satellite galaxies going around Andromeda as well. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. One down there and then one, one up there. And those satellite galaxies are probably at least partially responsible for the well-defined spiral arms that we see on Andromeda. That's amazing. So, can you can you queue up M42 while we're somebody? We had a request for M42, and it's I know it's going to be going down pretty soon for you. 
Yeah, yeah, it's getting low. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, we have you haven't talked in time lately about just what a star party is. <laughs> and you might want to let everybody know, you know, we're trying to simulate a real star party and what really happens. Sure, yeah. I and tell me you've been to more than I have. Of it. Is it? <laughs> right. So so normally what happens is is a whole bunch of people show up. If it's a single evening star party, you might show up about an hour before sunset. Um, and it's a lot like tailgating in a certain regard. You come in, you open up your trunk, you open up your doors, you're pulling out the table and you're putting the snack food and the star charts on it. Uh, someone inevitably has a ham radio to do satellite passes. You set up all of your equipment. Um, inevitably there's one person that struggles, everyone helps them to get them working. And then as the sun goes down and stars start popping up, you end up floating between the different telescopes or working concertedly on your own to accomplish some sort of a mission, say as many uh, double stars as possible or uh, observing the eclipse of a binary star. You'll get some people working on science projects, some people working on imaging projects. And what's amazing is you don't even need to show up with your own telescope. This is part of why I don't own a telescope. You can show up and you can pitch in and you can help and you can talk to lots of other people, look through their scope, figure out what it is you want to own before you have to shell out the hundreds to thousands of dollars to buy it and just enjoy our universe and eat snack food. And there's usually um, lots and lots of caffeine involved. But I think our real objective with this is to give you a chance to see what it's like to look through different telescopes. I mean, we've got a pretty wide range of, of telescopes happening here tonight. Um, actually, you know what? We don't have a wide range of telescopes tonight, now that I think about it. We have three 14-inch telescopes, and uh, it was an 8-inch telescope with, with Roy. So, um, but no, but you, but, you know, we've got a bunch of different setups. In this case, uh, Gary's setup is a 14-inch telescope. But he's got his set up with a um, uh, set for a very wide field of view, and it's really set up for a very light polluted sky, and so really good at viewing some of these these deep sky objects, very faint objects, but really too wide of a field of view to view anything any of the planets. And we've we've tried to view Jupiter and Mars and things with with Gary's setup, and it's just you know too tiny. You can barely you can barely see it. While Mitchell and um, Mitchell and Mike have got these just nice 14 inches, but they're set up for planetary observing. And then, uh, hey, and there's Ray. Um, and then we've got Roy's set up, which is, I guess, kind of splitting the difference. I mean, Roy, I mean, Roy's set up is more of a sort of in-between. You've done some, some deep sky observing, some faint objects, and you've also done some, you can also do some planetary stuff with that set up with, it, with an 8 inch. So that's great. So uh, Ray Sanders just joined us. Have you got a view, Ray? Can you hear us, Ray? No? Okay. Um, oh, and Mark wanted to join us. Now, Mark's totally clouded out, but Mark was going to show us his, uh, his setup because we were talking about uh, how, to set up a, how to set up a camera. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to go grab it, and I'll set it up in front of my little webcam here. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Waiting do we want to discuss M42 while we wait? Sure, let's do that. So, so Gary, we've got uh, we've got M42 coming in. Yes, we do. And this is um, it's a difficult object because the center is extremely bright, and the arms around the outside are very dim. So if I take it the way the camera saw it, you can see the center area with a 10 second exposure, all the stars in the center are blown out, and that's a triangulum, right? Uh, Pamela? Yes. So they're real bright stars that are illuminating all this, but you can see this whole area around here is just blown out. For me to see that, I've got to do a second or a half a second exposure. And then I can see the stars in the middle, but I don't get any of this. And then what I do is what's called stretching, and I'll grab the upper part, the highlights, bring them up, bring them down towards dark, and you can see this area gets blown out faster. But all of a sudden, you start to see all this wispy stuff in here. And this is just, it's phenomenal to just study it, even visually. If you get on the scope and see this, all of this, you, you can, every time you look, you see something different with the little arms and the tendrils and 
and this is actually two M M forty two and forty three, right? This one's forty three, and then right here is a nice one that's called the uh, Running Man Nebula. In fact, I'll uh, I'll reposition the scope a little bit and try to get a longer exposure on that one. Now, one one of the awesome things to think about this is all of those bright stars that make imaging this so trying at times. Those are all stars that are much much bigger than our sun, and the majority of them are going to explode as supernova. So what we now see as this one large, beautiful star-forming nebula is eventually going to become a whole set of overlapping uh, super, uh, supernova remnants. And, and that's just kind of cool to think about. Um, sure, yeah, why don't you reposition? And we can see um, Mark's setup now. Oh, there we go. That's perfect. So what have we got, Mark? Oh, I think you're muted. The eternal problem. Yeah, so it's just a little Mead 90 millimeter. Uh, on the back here, there's a little T adapter uh, that replaces the lens on the camera, and you just screw it to the back of the telescope. My particular telescope has a uh, a little flip knob here where you it either projects the image up through the eyepiece or out back into the camera. And that that uh, telescope, um, how big is it? Uh, it's it's 90 millimeters, so you know that's the this distance here. So what 90 millimeters? So what about three and a half inches? But it's a refractor, right? Uh yeah, it's a uh, no, it's a okay. reflector. It's a reflector. It's a okay, yeah. Schmidt Katzian design or something like that. Two guys' names who I can't pronounce. Yeah, Schmidt Katzian. Yeah. Um, and uh, now have you actually got a go-to mount on that, or is it? Oh uh, yeah, there, there's a little uh, little go-to hand box that comes with it. And uh, I can hook my computer up to it and control it via the software that came with it. So I can, in theory, slew around objects. Uh, it's not as accurate as I would hope it would be, but so. And what is the, what do those run? Like if if person wanted a telescope like that? Uh, this brand new, I think, was about four hundred to four hundred and fifty dollars, and it comes with the, a pretty stable tripod, the go-to controller. Uh, 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 comes with one eyepiece, the finder scope. Uh, yeah, so it it's a pretty cheap out of the box way to get going. Yeah, yeah, but that's a good it's a good way to start doing some astrophotography, doing some, um, getting some views, especially if you've already got the DSLR. I mean, you've already spent the the thousand dollars and you're using a Canon camera. Yeah, I, I've, I've got a T3i, which is uh, you know the body alone is uh, you know five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars, depending on. Uh, what special do you get that way? Yeah, I've got the exact same camera. So does Pamela. Yeah. So, so it's, you guys have good taste in cameras. <laughs> I just I just got it about uh, three months ago, and I actually just took a bunch of pictures today with it of uh, Herring Row. You know, and, and, and I just buy what Fraser tells me to buy. My, my friend teased me when I bought it because he had a T2I at the time, and I had to be one better than him. But this <laughs> little this little reticulating, uh, you know, movable mm -hmm. LCD panel is great for getting some weird low angle shots and you know things you wouldn't normally be able to do. So we have a couple questions in the Hangout. I see Neil McQuigan um, is asking how the Milky Way and Andromeda are different. Well the biggest difference is the Milky Way galaxy, if you're able to fly above it and look down, it has a straight bar through its center and then the spiral arms actually come off of that bar. We're also about 30% smaller, and we have slightly different star, form star formation rates. So it, the biggest difference is just that bar through the center makes us a different type of galaxy. Um, the other question we had is, Matt Simmons is asking um, if, if anyone knows when the solar eclipse will be that will cross um, through, the, through America and when the partial eclipse is. So I, I, I'm taking a guess at, at what you're asking about. And you can find all information on eclipses at eclipse.gsfc.nasa.gov. And on May 20th of this year, there's actually going to be a really neat annular eclipse that passes across Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico. And it's going to be visible at a number of national parks. And, and so if you're looking for an excuse to go camping in May, um, this is the absolute perfect opportunity. And then tw in 2017, there's, there's a total solar eclipse that's actually going to pass 30 miles south of my house 
it's, it's nominally um, a music-loving solar eclipse. It goes through Oregon, passing fairly near Portland, uh, crosses through the, the mid parts of the country, through Colorado, skipping down to Missouri and southern Illinois. So it essentially goes all but over St. Louis and Nashville, uh, crosses the entirety of the United States. So if you're looking for an excuse to come to the United States, 2017 is the year to do it. All right, let's go back to that uh, that beautiful view of Orion. Yeah, this is the, um, I focused in on the running man. And again, seeing the dynamic range, to stretch it, you see I've blown this out completely. You can't even make out the two different ones here. But this guy, especially when you add up the colors, is gorgeous. But they call it the running man. If you look careful, it looks like there's a leg here, a leg here. Here's a body, an arm, an arm, and a head. So that is the Running Man Nebula, and I, one of my favorites. So, so Mark, I, I just noticed you had a, you had a video there of, of one of your Saturn uh, videos. Yeah, that was a picture we, uh, I did of Saturn last night. Uh, let me screen share it again. Yeah, that'd be great. So there, this is. Uh, and so, and th this was uh, 500 images uh, stacked. And that's the setup that you that you were doing yep. that you just showed us. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. If anyone wants to know what it looks like to see uh, to see Saturn in a small telescope, this is this is that's what you see. So, and we're hoping um, in a, in pretty soon we'll get a chance to see uh, to get a chance to see that. So, oh, you want to go to M one hundred one? So yeah, hopefully uh, Saturn is going to rise for the guys on the East Coast in a, probably around now. So as soon as possible, we'll switch over to Saturn and try and get a view of that live. So so Gary, did you want to try and go to one hundred one? I can try that. Put it in here. You just let the computer, let the telescope drive to M101. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is great. I mean, this is this is exactly perfect. I mean, you can see what what Mark has. That's a great example of a real entry level telescope. Uh, but it's got the go to mount, which is a real time saver. Really nice way to just view different parts of the sky because um, I can say uh, I can definitely. You know, say when you've got a, a telescope that you're trying to guide it manually, it's it's very difficult and it's it's useless for doing any astrophotography. So you definitely need to get a. Uh, um, oh, oh, this is the video he's playing. Yeah. So yep. so if you want like an entry level telescope, I personally would choose mount over size because in many cases you can definitely get you know you got a go to mount they can take you it's nice and stable you can hook a camera up to you can do some astrophotography you can view lots of stuff once you but once you go for a really big telescope then the, then everything gets more and more expensive and so for a, you know i personally would would choose a smaller entry level telescope that need 90 millimeters is a great little telescope yeah celestron does a similar one you know, so if you're going to do visual observing, then you want something more like a Dobsonian. But, um, yeah, awesome. So what else we got? What's Mike viewing? Is that, that looks like street light again, Mike. No, actually, uh, I was going to brave the clouds and try to get M... 65, which is a galaxy, and I don't know if it's going to fit in this CCD or not. And I'm not too far away, but I'm not on top of it yet either. So, it took me a while to find the focus point for this camera without the magnification in it. And Roy, I think your focus is a little off. Yeah, <laughs> I only had to go about 50,000 steps on my focuser when I took out my power mate. Oh, <laughs> right. Now is it now is this is the Canon now, right? Yeah, I moved over to M42 so I'd have some bright stars that I could quickly center in on. That's great. So if, if any of you are interested in going back and reviewing past uh, star parties, seeing what else we've done, um, we have an archive page over on CosmoQuest. Go to CosmoQuest.org. It's, it's under Cosmo Academy. 
we're trying to keep track of everything we're doing, and in future weeks, we're actually going to be putting together an image gal gallery for all the great things that these gentlemen are doing. Oh, there it is. Okay. I got it. Oh, look at look at Gary's view of M101. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. So M101, this is the uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, right? No, that's no? M51. M51. Oh, so which is 101? Um, pinwheel. Pinwheel. I think so. Yeah. 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 This is the Pinwheel Galaxy. This is another one of William Herschel's discoveries. Uh, this is one of my favorites because it's so airy. A lot of these face-on uh, galaxies, you have uh, really thick, uh, filled with lots of patches of light, um, what are called flocculent spiral structure, or you get these big, powerful arms like with M51. But this one's just sort of sitting there with this little tiny bright nucleus, these arms, just sort of like you took a, an octopus and you spun it, and it, it has these arms that are spinning around it. Not that you should spin octopi. And I'm going to do a um, two-minute two exposure. My audio is still pretty high, isn't it, Fraser? It's, it's a lot better now, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that sounds just fine. Whatever you're doing now, it sounds just great. Um, so you're doing a two-minute exposure on that? And I think Ray yeah. was going to try and get the same object, but I'm only seeing... I have no idea what I'm seeing on Ray's view. You have too many telescopes, Fraser. <laughs> I know. I would, let me count them. One, two, three... Oh, no, that's not a real telescope. Mark's telescope is a lie. One... Right. Two, three, four, five telescopes tonight. Fraser's just trying to pwn all the astronomical glass. <laughs> yep. Oh, there's so there's there's uh, Roy's M42, which is a little different. Yeah, I still gotta focus. So I'm <laughs> since this is the uh, my DSLR, I can bring this in in color. Oh, yeah, awesome. please do. So I just, I just gotta focus it first. Yeah, that'll be amazing. And then, Mike, what have you got? This is M65. I don't know uh, if there's any other more interesting galaxies nearby here that I can find. Uh, this is only a 1.2 like second exposure. That's what I was wondering. It's a very quick exposure. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a uh, full gain, and it's only 1.2 1, 1. seconds. So I think I can get up to 2. I'm just not sure how i got to get it cranked up here. So, so this, if, if we're able to get it, is a galaxy that's very edge-on and has very prominent uh, dust, but other than that, it just seems to mostly, in amateur telescopes, be this smooth, diffuse light with a ring of dust around it. Um, What's so nearby 65 that's, that's more interesting or brighter, maybe? I closed Stellarium um, reopening. M94. Uh, oh, we've got a request for the Horsehead Nebula, so we can do that in a second. There is 101 at uh, two minutes. That's beautiful. That's fantastic. Can you can you? Uh, Darken the contrast a little bit. It's still pretty bright. Yeah. Or the vignetting. I can't lose the vignetting yet. I will um, for next time. I'll have a way to automatically apply that. I thought I had it working. You did have it working, but yeah, it's acting weird. So, and just a, an interesting note: um, the camera is actually capturing light levels in sixty-five thousand levels. So I've got zero to sixty-five thousand. Right now, I am stretching twelve thousand six hundred and twenty-two. I've told it is black, and seventeen thousand four hundred and seventy-six is white. So I've taken um, under a hundred, no, about a hundred and twenty, and made the whole picture those hundred and twenty light points. So we want a horse head, huh? Yeah. And and M fifty one. I I really like we did that was my highlight last week. Okay. 
And uh, Rosette Nebula. I am here to serve. <laughs> That's you awesome. just want everything. All of it. Thor's helmet. And Saturn. So I'm hearing reports, uh, Mike, that Saturn is at 19 degrees. Is that enough I for you? Think I'm, I'm going to lean on Mitchell for that one. No, I, I, I got a couple more hours before I'm going to catch it. Mitchell? 19 degrees? Uh, what do you think? Right, let me finish up a couple of cats and I'm shoot over to it. That'd be awesome. So M66 is near M65. Um, and M66 is okay. 0.3 magnitudes brighter. Oh, here uh, we go. So okay. Now we're getting Roy's uh, color view. Look at that. That's for quick. Well, show us for good now. Oh, that looks nice. <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, the let quick me is that. the quick is fantastic. I just I mean the color view is just a beautiful view. Let me try it twenty second. And so, what software are you using to actually do your capture with your your Canon? This is uh, Maxim DL. Same software I use for all of my CCD and everything. CCD webcam. It's all the same software. Now yeah. you do have to buy a special version of Maxim DL to hook it up with, with your um, a DSLR camera. So there's different varieties. So when you're purchasing it, just make sure you get the right version or you will be sad. Yeah. So I got M66. That's nice. I'm going to try to take a capture of this and see how this comes out. Noisy, I know. But yeah, it's pretty noisy. <laughs> And I apologize for all the audio problems we're having. When you get ten telescopes all, ten people all connected at the same time, it's it's harder and harder to manage all of the uh, all the technology. Oh, that's just phenomenal! Look at that image from Roy. That's gorgeous. And the, and the crazy thing is, like, that's the real thing. Like, that's the real color of this, right? If you yes, could see well, it with your yeah, when you look through a telescope, that's kind of what you see. Except you're doing a long exposure. Say that again. Oh, I'm just saying that it's a you know this, these are the kinds of colors that you see when you look at at the Orion Nebula. Yeah, if you had a big enough um, telescope, so say you were looking through the 82 inch at McDonald Observatory you'd be able to start to see color like this. And there actually is a program to be able to look through the McDonald Observatory 107 inch once a month and amateur clubs can petition to get time on the 82 inch. Um, somebody mentioned that you can use the EOS utility for uh, for this for for yeah. capturing with your Canon, but the problem is it always puts that little that little box on your screen, and I haven't been able no, to. No, the uh, the it. EOS utility that, that that comes on the DVD with your camera contains yeah. some software on it that will actually you can go in and say I want to do a batch of you know 12, 12 images five minutes each, and it yep. will take this CR2s or whatever, and it will do all that. And then you can take free software, like there's a Deep Sky Stacker, which will take all of those images and stack them for you. So you don't have to buy any software if you don't want to. So is this, is this a lot? Stacker's free. The yeah. EO software comes with the camera. Yep. So, so Gary, is this a live view of uh, the Horsehead Nebula? Um, yes, it is. Wow. That's a 60-second exposure. You can definitely see the horse head. So, so you're not. So, see if I understand correctly. How come you're not getting the vignetting with with this image? Is it because Be you're doing a wider view? No, it's just a brighter object. See, if I try to really squeeze it out, let's see. See, I'm picking it up there. Yeah. There's much more brightness. In fact, right now at this level. Um, my black is at 6,796, and my white is 13,107. So I've got 
uh, what, seven, 8,000 points. So, and that's the biggest difference. I just didn't need to stretch it as far so the vignetting doesn't show up. Which is the same reason why vignetting doesn't show up on your Canon camera because you're taking bright images and even though it's there, you'll never notice it. Right. That's the horse head. Let me see if I can pop it in a little bit. There we go. That looks right. And you and I notice you you definitely want to get you get the flame nebula at the same time, right? Yeah. And for anyone who wants to see where this is, that see that really really bright star there. Um, that's actually uh, oh man, I always forget the name of it. Is that Owl and Attack? It's the anyway, it's it's in the belt. So in Orion's belt, it's the um, it's the one on the left hand side of the belt. When you look up at, at Orion, it's the one that's further to the east. Yeah, for the northern hemisphere. For the northern hemisphere, that's right, sorry. Yeah. And for the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. So someone's phone is ringing. <laughs> um, what? Where is that? I hear echo. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm just gonna go back to that Orion Nebula, the one from uh, from Roy. So, is there any other objects that you could see, like any star clusters or something? That's what I'm looking at to see if I can find something else here. Well, uh, while you were sure, that would be great. Theory. What, yeah. what what are you currently point? I can try to play these. I might be able to get it. That'd be great. It would just depend on where it is. Forty-five. So look at this. We got the Horsehead Nebula. We've got, uh, is it M65, is that right, from Mike? We've 66, got Mars, I think. M66, we've got Mars, which is just phenomenal. Uh, I don't know what Ray is showing us here. Now, I don't think Ray's mic isn't working, so. And then Roy's got the Orion Nebula. Count them up. That's awesome. All right, so so Gary, could we go and take a look at the rosette? If you I'm moving there right now. Oh, oh that's and, great. Uh, my audio changed a little bit. I switched to a different mic. Uh, for some reason, that one is uh, its gain is increasing when I don't talk. So I have yeah. something going on in the software. Yeah, no, this this one sounds good. Okay, hopefully this, this one will do that. All right, let's see. Did I move it? Yeah. And just again, a reminder, if you've joined us a little late, if you could plus one this while you're, you're watching on uh, Google+, Plus, that would be awesome, so we can get an idea of how many people are watching this. That would be really helpful. Um, I'm hearing some echo coming from somewhere. I think it's coming from John. Yeah, it was coming from John. Oh, maybe not. No, we're still getting the, the, uh, the sound from you. Gary, if you can move the mic back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, very, very weird. Something's going on. I'll have to troubleshoot it. It's pretty common with this, with the with the Google Hangouts. What it'll do is is if you don't talk for a while, it'll think that it's it's messed up and then it'll just try and it'll just keep trying to boost the gain again and again and again until it can hear you. And so a lot of the times when you first jump into a hangout, it's really, really loud. And then you have to once you talk, then it figures out the right the right volume level. So that's the Rosette Nebula, which is one of my favorite. We're going to go to my two favorite uh, objects in the night sky if we can. Um, this is one of them. This is the Rosette Nebula, and it is it's just a phenomenal object. I mean, you can just see how big it is. It's probably four times as big as the moon in the sky, but it's just very faint. Yeah, what you're seeing right now is a 10 second, and I'm doing a 60 second. Uh, John, one one thing that would be really helpful if you're if you wanted to screen share some official views of some of these photographs, that, so like some official photographs of what we're looking at, and that way we can compare and contrast. So if you want to screen share off a, a Hubble view of the Rosette Nebula, for example, then we can show what it looks like in Gary's view, and then a, a Hubble view of it, and, peop and people can kind of see what the, the the similarity of the parts are. Um, 
But yeah, that is absolutely beautiful. Man, I love that. Just about done with the uh, one minute exposure. Doesn't even need it. You'll, you'll see quite a bit more come out. It's all white. <laughs> That's quite a bit more. There you go. Oh, wow, yeah. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> look at that. And you can see those dark tendrils over on the bottom left-hand side of it. So this is a system that, just like I spoke about earlier, where we um, had the Pac-Man nebula. In this case, um, it's a completely different shape for the exact same type of structure. You again have the open cluster of stars towards the center. They're giving off a lot of light. That light is ionizing the hydrogen cloud that they're embedded within. That light, in turn, is becoming ionized. But when it re, when a hydrogen atom re grabs on an electron, um, the cascade down through the energy levels predominantly produces, as far as our telescopes are concerned, this beautiful, you can't tell it's red, but it's red, um, luminosity. And where you see the dark, uh, it looks like you had termites going through the nebula, where you see those dark paths through the nebula, that's actually where the material is, is bunched up and it's, it's preventing the background light from passing through and being observable. That's phenomenal. <clears throat> um, and then why don't we go to M51, if it's still up. <laughs> I believe this is, the, this is a photograph. So this is an example of a photo that Gary did a little while ago blending three different colors of light together, but using a lot of the hydrogen alpha as the as the red. Right. Sorry, I was still uh, muted. <laughs> why, I don't know why my game keeps going up. I don't know. Um, but definitely mute it in between. Like when you're not when you're not talking, definitely mute it because it's definitely picking up a lot of sound in the background from you. Yeah. And then yeah. I start talking and forget to unmute it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's, that that's one I took previously, and the hydrogen alpha is real close to its natural color, and in this particular one, the hydrogen is uh, red. I've mapped the sulfur as green, and there's very little sulfur in there, so you're not seeing the green. And the oxygen is blue. So you can see in the center area, I'm starting to go to the purple range, which tells you there's some blue in there. So there's definitely some oxygen in this cloud also. That's really great. And, uh, and Roy is bringing in Pleiades. That's Are you still building right the image, Roy? My, that's the view through my finder scope. I'm still uh, taking taking the images. And, and oh, you okay, great. right there. I just that wanted is. to show you what it was. Go yeah, ahead. that's how big it is. And even in my finder scope, it's huge. And, and you can see in that particular image, that is the Subaru car symbol. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no question. Boy, I wonder how much so Subaru paid for I that. Get an exposure with some nebulosity. It's cool. And so then you can see Gary's telescope moving over to M fifty one. And this is another of my favorite objects. That's great. So, what do you think, Mitchell? Can you uh, can you see Saturn? Can you take us out on Saturn tonight? Actually, probably another ten or fifteen minutes. I'll be there. Okay. Are you still actually recording video of Mars? Yeah, the uh, seeing has improved drastically. Yeah, so it does, it looks, it's a phenomenal spot. view. That's out of focus. <laughs> Really? It looks in focus to me. Yeah, 
I'm slightly out of focus on that one. There you go. And if you look carefully, you can see the uh, the little swirl in the uh, northern, I mean, the north polar cap, where the ice is basically melted away. And I can lower the gamma some, maybe you can see more detail. Oh, right, because it's summer in uh, uh, on the northern hemisphere. That's a little bit so higher. Part than of that. Yeah, and so part of that cap has has faded away. That's really cool. Not a lot of blue. What? What's what are those loops that you're getting in your image, Roy? I There's don't have the. Uh, off I just object. quickly put the uh, the camera next to my uh, focal reducer. I don't have the right spacing, so if it's too bright, I get a a really bad reflection. Hmm. And those stars are really bright. <laughs> yeah, they are. And so this is this is part of Pleiades, though. Yep. Those are really awesome image artifacts, though. If you're going to have an image <laughs> artifact, it, it looks like they're all currently uh, bugs with giant carapaces. Well, I need something narrower. Wow, look at that. That, ver that view of Mars it just keeps getting better and better. Your seeing is just getting better and better, Mitchell. Oh, it's outstanding. I might want to shoot back over to it. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I got my cooler on, too. <laughs> Actually, I think it warmed up outside some. Maybe it's the clouds that are passing by. Is that another photo, Gary? Yeah, that's a um, true color photo of the Pleiades taken from a very dark location. So if I try with, to look with at your with my scope, with that yeah, telescope, with red, green, and blue filters, if I try to take um, Pleiades through hydrogen alpha, all I see is the stars, because there's really no hydro not much hydrogen glowing here. But when I got to a dark location and took a nice exposure, that's I just thought I'd reference that real quick. That's beautiful. And is the is the moon up for you guys on the east coast yet? Uh, it's rising. It's not quite up yet. So you can't see it yet? No. I can. It's trapped in the clouds the and way down the trees. It. But, I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> about five, five degrees over the horizon at best. Yeah. Man, that is the best Mars I think I've ever seen in, a, in one of these hangouts by far. That's amazing. And Mark's fake, fake Saturn. <laughs> I gotta feel like I'm contributing a little bit here. <laughs> for this me, was real we, last night. Uh, we, Roy can vouch for me. Yeah, if we were looking at uh, Saturn, this is what we would see. <laughs> Although it would look a little, um, but this is on the on the 90 millimeter, so it would be uh, depending on which telescope we'd be using. Oh, here we go. So there is my other favorite object. Look at that. And, Can you and fix the contrast a little bit, Gary? Like it's. Uh... So Ooh. this is th this is essentially the same type of galaxy as M M101, which we just saw, but with that companion, you end up with this perfect two-arm structure, basically. So that this is your quintessential grand design spiral. In the in interacting with that little galaxy on the right hand side of it, right? Yeah, it, it's the gravity from that little galaxy that drives the spiral density waves that create the structure. And when you um, get a good exposure of it, you can see all in this area there's a cloud-like, yeah. which is all stars that were gravitationally thrown out 
and it just it it looks like haze. It's really gorgeous. Go brush your teeth. Do it. I, I don't want to brush yeah, my you're teeth. You're gonna fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make me. Oh man. <laughs> Yeah, my son's gonna come in here. He's gonna watch. He's gonna watch the hangout, and then he's gonna pass out. It's happened before. All of you, it's time to brush your teeth. But my daughter doesn't have any teeth. <laughs> <laughs> that unfortunately solves itself over time. <laughs> All right. Well, have we got any more requests then? Because I think we're sort of reaching the end of end of this. I love that galaxy though. Know. That is so great. Any requests? I see an M104. Bit bit low. Yeah. M99. M81. M82. M63. Yeah, I tried. Um, I think it was M101 earlier. And there's a football field near my house, and it was just washing everything out. Well, we could do the uh, 81 and 82. Sure. So the, there was a question about how far M51 is away from the Earth, and, and the answer is it's 23 megalight years. So far. What about Comet Girard? I don't think it would show up in Hydrogen Alpha, but Roy, mm -hmm. what about you? I think it's an Ursa Major. Ooh. Test. See if I can find it. Yeah, it's on my list of to-dos, but I'm definitely clouded in the north, and I got trees where I am, so I'm gonna, it's like either or for me. So I, I don't know if anyone's been watching, but while this has been going, we're getting seeing more of uh, of that that dark portion of of Mars. You can see it rotating into view. Yeah, that's so Certus Major. Certus Major, yeah, yeah, is that kind of horn over on the left hand side of Mars, and it's moved, and that cloud has moved as well. So the whole thing is rotating. Yeah, Mars' rotation period is, is just, I think, about 45 minutes longer than the planet Earth's. So, so if you can imagine, our entire planet rotates about 15 degrees an hour. Well, Mars is going to be rotating a little bit slower than that, but uh, not a lot. So you can actually watch it rotate in a realistic way. Well, I was trying to get the Owl Nebula, but uh, even at 60 seconds, it's way too dim. Mizar, someone said. Mizar is the uh, is the double double in uh, in the Big Dipper, isn't it? No. Yeah. No. I don't. I Mizar is so. not. Yeah. Is Mizar in the Big Dipper? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, it's the, it's the double handle double. Part. That yeah. really good oh, yeah, eyes. Okay. You see, it's two stars, and then with telescopes, you can split into four stars. It used to be. I think it was either Roman or Greek armies. It was a test to become one of the ultra elite was if you could split it with your eyes. Just lie. <laughs> I totally see it. <laughs> <laughs> I totally see it. I see like two stars there. It's not just one. Don't chop my head off, please. <laughs> no? That's great. Okay, well, I'm not going to. Uh, what? I'm not going to threaten you guys with. Uh, what? Um, sorry. Yeah, if you, I'm, I don't want to sort of push you guys too far. But if anyone could get a view of Saturn, I'd really appreciate it. If not, we'll save that for uh, for next week's uh, next week's start party. Well, I got a slight problem. Clouds beat me to the actual yeah. Saturn tonight. Yeah. It's really, right. really patchy, and it, it looks like it's just going to get worse, yeah. actually. It's yeah. the only part of the sky with clouds, actually. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I got tons over here, but I'm, I'm more towards Raleigh. So. Yeah, I was going to say, Saturn's not even, um, it's just barely clearing the horizon, but the walls in my observatory block to about, like, 10 degrees on the horizon. 
So I'm not going to be able to get Saturn. That Sorry, is Fraser. That's the disembodied voice of Ray Sanders. It is. The, the rumors of my uh, death at the hands of the Cardinal at the Ren Fair are greatly exaggerated. Uh, well, we so there is... M, that's M81 and M82, right? For Gary? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's M81 and M82. There you go. And, and the one on the right is, is uh, in the process of having a very hard millennium. It's, it's been interacting lately. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. <laughs> it hasn't done that before. I'm really concerned. Phenomenal. All right, well, then I won't, we'll get a chance to see Saturn Live, so instead we'll just get a chance to see Mark's uh, view of it last night, which is, uh, which is fantastic. So, again... Yeah, this didn't happen until about 1 a.m. Central Time last night, and I w even then I was yeah. shooting it through trees, so... Yeah, so we're going to get... Saturn's going to be, be rising earlier and earlier as the, uh, as the spring goes on, and I think by... I'm not sure exactly sure when, but by summer I'm sure we'll have it in... Uh, you know, as a nice object in the middle of the, uh, you know, in in a, in a reasonable time in the evening to view it. So that'll be the time. If you've got a friend with a telescope or you've got a telescope, then make sure that you show all your friends what Saturn looks like through the telescope because it really is the most impressive one. If anyone gets a chance to see Saturn through the telescope, that's when they get hooked. So we, we have over on Twitter, Denizen X is asking if we can stream a map of the galaxy so that we can see the areas being talked about. Um, he said there must be a 3D renderer out there. Well, no, not really, actually. That, that's one of the things that, that's problematic, is, is for within our galaxy, to a certain degree, yes, there are 3D render renderers. Uh, Microsoft's Worldwide Telescope, for one, work, works fairly well. But where we start talking about things that are, are millions to billions of light years away, you run into the problem when you do a 3D renderer of trying to take into consideration um, like travel times and things like that, so so a lot of people just sort of stop rendering. Um, so yeah, no, sorry. Fantastic. Okay, well I think I'm going to wrap this up at this point. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to uh, to Gary and Mark and Mike and uh, Mitchell and Ray and Roy for for joining us. Thanks for Pamela. real quick, real quick before you disappear. Yep. I've got it on the owl. <laughs> oh, little and, owl uh, nebula. Here's a one-minute exposure. Can you embiggen it? I can. Although digitally. Let me so as, we, as, as Gary is bringing in this uh, final view of the owl nebula, um, thanks to everyone who is watching. If you haven't already, could you please plus one this? Um, we'll be doing this again. We'll try to do this every Sunday night, um, and you can watch it either. Make sure you circle me on uh, on Google Plus. You can also see it over on CosmoQuest.org/hangouts. And uh, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. And over the course of the year, we'll get more and more different and interesting things to show you. So thanks again. Thanks thanks to thanks Gary for this uh, final beautiful view of the uh, of the Owl Nebula. It's just fantastic. All right. Quite welcome. We'll see, guys, we'll see you guys all later. We'll see you next next time. Uh, we're going to be recording Astronomy Cast tomorrow at noon Pacific Daylight Time, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time, and I have no idea now what. Yeah, time we that is we've lost the rest of the planet temporarily. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll see you tomorrow when we do Astronomy Cast. All right. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you guys later. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye.